Louis Isador Khan and the National Assembly Building in Dakar, Bangladesh. Designing a building for a nation is hard, but designing a building for a new nation is even harder. With its formal vocabulary, complex spatial qualities and manipulation of light and water, Louis Khan managed to make a building that defined the new nation of Bangladesh. The National Assembly Building was a project on yellow paper. While his European colleagues preferred white paper, Louis Kahn always worked on the thinnest yellow paper. It is a sign for work in progress. No matter how long in the process you are or how detailed of a drawing you do, the strokes will still be wet and changeable on yellow paper. The project will simply remain a subject to change, criticism and rejection. And the National Assembly Building was no exception. Not only Khan can be credited for the outcome of this long commission. The changing cultural conditions affected the purpose of the building while it was built. Bringing a new western material like concrete to the east called for expert help and the development of new techniques. And the country the building was meant for literally changed in the middle of designing the building when Bangladesh declared its independence from Pakistan in 1971. So designing the National Assembly Building in Dakar was a project on yellow paper. Maybe that is also why it took over 20 years to develop this masterpiece. How did Louis Khan even end up in East Pakistan? Louis Isador Khan, the Estonian-born architect from America, represented the Western modern world when he got commissioned to design the National Assembly Building in Dakar. And it was of American interest to show off as much as possible regarding new technology, architecture and politics at the time. Remember that this is the time of the Cold War. So for the USA to show their take on modern architecture, whether it being about how one builds or on the most tech developed and up to date design and construction processes was important. Also for General Ayub Khan, who was leading the country of East Pakistan when Louis Khan was commissioned, it was important to please the superpower ally during the Cold War, the USA. After Bangladesh declared its independence, the building's diplomatic and national character became even stronger, stimulating the urge for a democratic meeting point for the new country. This cross-continent team of Philadelphia-based architects and South Asian-based engineers were working very hard to provide Bangladesh with just this. But Louis Khan was not an easy man to dance with. His ideas were intuitive and he was not afraid to stir the pot if a new idea came across his mind. A Pakistani engineer working with the Louis Khan team on the project wrote in 1968 that Professor Khan waits for the inspiration and then personally supervises further development of his idea at all stages of its development. On many occasions, far-reaching changes are made. Then, while the idea of the day for a particular work is being developed by the office, the professor may think out a better solution and the whole process of discussion is repeated. This method of designing caused a lot of communication problems and it complicated the process, making it time and money consuming to finish the project. But Khan's goals was not profit or efficiency, but rather the aesthetic quality of the building. Also Khan's clear mission for the building was to shape the society, providing good spatial frames for educational and political institutions for individuals to make their own choices about their lives. The National Assembly Building of Bangladesh, or Yatya Sangsan Baban, is a building with a lot more to tell than what one could guess. The massive structure is located in the capital, Dhaka, and was commissioned in 1961 and completed in 1982. However, the construction of it did not run entirely smoothly, as it was halted in 1971 when Bangladesh gained independence from Pakistan. The original intention was to create a building with a monumental presence, but along with the independence, the assembly became a symbol of democracy and pride for the Bengali people. The construction is an extension to the parliamentary headquarters and has a seemingly simple design made out of concrete with visible bands of marble. 
The act of combining the fundamentals of modernism with vernacular materials and methods became not only an efficient workway, but also a necessity, as the building's location in the desert would require resistance against the extreme heat. The building is constituted by eight halls surrounding the central parliamentary grand chamber, connected through horizontal and vertical corridors, stairways, and lifts. The south of the building constitutes a Muslim prayer hall, which does not follow the pattern of the rest, as it faces Mecca. The walls of the construction are constituted as layers, where the external walls have enormous openings, adding a dramatic impact to the composition. This second layer hides the small windows on the first layer, which enables shade for the offices. Additionally, these openings are unglazed, a concept rooted in Roman architecture, which Kahn embraced, arguing that if Romans could do it without glass, so could he. Furthermore, the geometric shapes of the cutouts are not just randomly chosen. They are in fact found in traditional Bengali culture, applied with the purpose of establishing a relationship between old and new cultural identities. Apart from constituting light wells, they enable thermal control for the interior, Together with the thickness of the walls and the surrounding artificial lake, they function as a natural insulator and cooling system. Moreover, in Kahn's opinion, light was in fact a crucial aspect in the design of a building, any of his buildings, not just this one. Besides illumination, he considered light a creator of space. The systematic geometric openings compose an interplay of light and shadow, allowing the light to quantify the space making it the primary element for sculpting architecture. Every single space is to be defined by even the smallest crack of natural light in order to genuinely feel the presence. Kahn said, every space must have natural light because it is impossible to read the configurations of a space or shape by having only one or two ways of lighting it. Natural light enters the space released by the choice of construction. It was so important, even the electrical light was designed to not interfere with the entering sunlight. The purpose was to allow a continuous change of the light scenery from dawn to sunset. He said, So light, this great maker of presence, can never be brought forth by the single moment in light which the electric bulb has. And natural light has all the moods of the time of the day, the seasons of the year, which year for year and day for day are different from the day preceding. Louis Kahn is often credited with having introduced modern architecture to Bangladesh in his National Assembly in Dhaka, but since both modern construction techniques and modernist forms had already made inroads in the city before the National Assembly, modern architecture was already in use. The true originality and importance of the National Assembly resides in the care with which he built in reinforced concrete and the forms into which he required that it be cast. Modern architecture claimed to represent modernity through the use of abstract forms generated out of the properties of new materials, such as concrete and steel, used to construct them. Yet, reinforced concrete was often used, especially in European colonies, far in advance of the arrival of the industrialization they were supposed to represent. When looking at the history of concrete, the development and spread of the material around the world was rapid due to the fact that little skilled labor was required and the offer of solidity at a relatively modest cost at the time. The low cost of labor meant, however, that mechanization remained rudimentary with most concrete being mixed by hand and much of it carried into position on the heads of poorly paid women. Following the independence of India and Pakistan in 1947, the subcontinent became a showcase for the most modern architecture of the 1950s and 60s, much of it built by imported experts out of reinforced concrete. The leaders of newly independent countries used up-to-date architecture to signal the modernity of their new states. As an imported Western expert, Kahn introduced practices that adhered to his personal theoretical and aesthetic position, rather than to local or international norms when building the National Assembly. Three different approaches to concrete coexisted in this time. 
The first was skeletal framing, in which stucco could be expected to cover both the concrete and the brick infill. The second was monolithic concrete, with very rough finishes. And the third was lightweight shell construction. Only the first was widely used in Dhaka already in 1962. Louis Kahn Salk Institute in La Jolla, finished in 1965, provided the point of departure for Kahn's approach to concrete when he began to work on the National Assembly in Dhaka in 1962. At Salk, he focused on the quality of the concrete in a rejection of beton brut by controlling the plywood formwork, which he coated with a plastic resin to achieve a nearly velvet finish. He focused on monumentality and the integrity of the material with a new emphasis on a high degree of finish. Kahn initially sought to import the same high degree of finish found in the Salk Institute into the very different building culture of East Pakistan. Forced to compromise, Kahn had to develop a system that responded to the demands that he referenced indigenous Islamic architecture as well as to the technical capacities of local construction workers. The shift from a relatively low-tech version of concrete framing to an unusually careful one presented enormous challenges, and Louis Kahn himself wanted the National Assembly to lead by example, and said that it should be considered semi-experimental for the sake of inducing better efforts on the part of architects and builders of Dhaka. He also specified that concrete walls, piers, columns, beams and slab soffits will be exposed in the final building, therefore the utmost skill in science, technology and workmanship will be required. Louis Kahn's monolithic approach to concrete represented not state-of-the-art technology but modernist aesthetics. Its palpable sense of heft represented one position within a modern movement, away from an emphasis on lightness and towards an engagement with monumentality and permanence. Kahn's frustration with the inconsistent and often artless concrete pourings on sites and his insistence on a particular finish lays claim to what had perennially been the domain of worksite contractors, the design of the formwork, and instead highlights the importance of the architect's involvement in the construction of the building in order to obtain the correct aesthetics. Louis Kahn had a stroke in the New York subway and never got to finish his masterpiece, but his great involvement in the team and with some help from his not very credited African-American architect colleague, he managed to create a new reality for the new nation, creating perfect spatial frames for a democratic nation and a changing society.